Okay, I've made the executive decision that for the rest of this video, I will be wearing the pirate hat. Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video. If you're looking for some new earbuds, then check the link in the description to get your hands on a discount code. Also, my book, Hearing Queer, which is an inclusive and joyful guide to life for queer girls and women, is coming out in less than a month. So you still have time to pre-order and get your hands on a signed book plate. Info will be in the description. Okay, this silly little show about gay pirates, this show has been trending for weeks, it's all over my For You page. On TikTok, the fandom are uploading 100 new fanfics every single day on AO3. It's more in demand than Euphoria and Moon Knight. How the hell did we get here? Yo ho ho and a can of caffeine-free Diet Coke. My name's Ryan Ellis and today I'm gonna to be doing a deep dive into Our Flag Means Death, breaking down the themes explored in the show, the importance of its queer characters, how it ties into the history of piracy and more. I don't think it was a surprise to a lot of us that the show was popular. I mean, just look at the creative team involved, but it definitely wasn't expected to be this popular. However, I think it's pretty clear at this point why it's taken off in such a way. First, the show is just really good. It's both hilarious and genuinely touching. The writing and performances, directing, editing are all excellent and it comes together to create a first season that, to be honest, in my opinion, like doesn't have any bad episodes. It also has a diverse cast that is treated well within their narratives. They're given lead roles, interesting romances and plot lines, and there's a lack of tone deaf jokes at their expense. It's a low bar, but I guess somebody has to clear it. This is also a show in an established genre that allows for unexpected twists, as well as an in-depth examination of the tropes involved. Crossing over a pirate show with a workplace comedy gives us an opportunity to explore the contrast between the two as what we might in the office have seen as a run-of-the-mill episode about new management systems can become a life or death situation in Our Flag Means Death. But the key factor that has drawn audiences in, shown by the exponential increase in attention after the airing of episodes 9 and 10, is its canonical queerness. Once that rainbow cat was out of the bag, the description of the gay pirate show began to make its rounds in the fan corners of the internet. It's interesting, but to be honest, unsurprising, that it took up until the Kiss episode for that to happen. I made a whole video about the most anticipated LGBTQ plus TV shows coming out this year. And while researching for that script, Our Flag Means Death literally never came up in any roundups, press releases, nothing. It wasn't until I read some interviews with the show's creator, David Jenkins, however, that I understood why that might have happened. He said of the romantic relationship between leads Ed Teach and Steed Bonnet, and then people were very afraid that we weren't going to do it. I didn't realize how deep that ran until honestly this week. After you watch the fifth episode, it's very clear that they're almost going to kiss and people either don't believe we're playing it or don't engage with it when they're writing about the show. That, I didn't expect that. I thought it was quite explicit that they had feelings for each other. People are picking up on it, but they don't actually believe that we're going there. Which, like, oh, my sweet summer child. Someone tell this poor, apparently straight man, literally anything about the history of queer representation on screen, I beg you. We so often see the sentiment of, oh, I had no idea that people would see that in my script from straight writers wanting to dismiss queer audiences seeing queerness in their work. So, You've got to love this flip of the script, even though it's slightly wild to me that queer baiting, one of the most frustrating and contentious issues in queer media, just totally passed this show's creator by. Like, you just have to look at the comments and replies of any post online telling people to watch the new gay pirate show, and you'll see dozens of people asking for explicit confirmation that the gay is actually gay. Like, we've been burned before, sir. We cannot go through that again. And so we come to the present, where I apparently have scripted my longest ever video essay about a 10 episode show that you all thankfully bullied me into watching. I actually reacted to the first episode of this show on Patreon. I have a tier over there where I do live reactions to movies and episodes of TV shows and immediately just went and binge watched the rest of it afterwards. It was so good. That wasn't meant to be a Patreon name drop, but since I just brought it up, um, if you are interested in helping support me make these videos and also getting some cool perks, then check it out. Uh, I do reactions, also make recommendation lists monthly and send out postcards and there's a Discord and it's just a very fun time. So I normally put like a casual mention of Patreon at the end of the video and I realize that people who don't watch to literally the last second maybe don't know about it. So 
hey, there it is. So I'm going to assume that if you're watching this, you've seen The Gay Pirate Show already, but if you haven't, or you want a quick recap, welcome to a mini chaos video within what is otherwise a pretty normal video essay. For everyone who subscribed to this channel after the Captain Marvel, Meerkat, Luca, Gay Disney Olympics videos, you're welcome for what is about to unfold. Okay, so we have wealthy landowner Steed Bonnet trying his hand at piracy on but his new ship, The Revenge, and boy, is he bad at it. His crew hates him and wants to mutiny. He tries to distract them by attempting to plunder a really big ship. And um, oh no, it turns out that ship is the British Navy. And even worse, the captain on that ship, Badminton, was Steed's childhood bully. Okay, so Badminton and a few other officers board the Revenge for what turns out to be a very awkward dinner party. Steed gives Badminton a tour of the ship and he does not appreciate our boys' interior design choices enough at all. Violence breaks out with the rest of the crew in the dining room after mysterious crew member Jim rightfully stabs a British sailor through the hand. Meanwhile, after Badminton calls Steed a coward, Steed hits him with a paperweight, trying his best at like violent non-violence, which backfires if Badminton impales himself on his sword, eye first, as he passes out. Uh, 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 uh. Now, Steed looks like a badass to his crew, they have a few officers as hostages, and he's on his way to being a real pirate. What could possibly go wrong? Episode 2! So the crew of the Revenge get distracted when Black Pete tells the story of when he totally sailed with Blackbeard. He totally never sailed with Blackbeard. And forget to, um, you know, steer the ship. So they run aground. Steed, haunted by visions of a still shish kebab badminton, encourages everyone to take a vacation. But he doesn't specify that the hostages they've taken do not get to do that and so they immediately escape. Meanwhile, Jim ditches the disguise he've been wearing and goes for a swim and Lucius, gay icon that he is, spots them and is like, oh, Jim's been pretending to be a man this whole time. Jim decides that the best way to ensure that Lucius keeps their secret is to stuff him in a trunk. So they do that. The islanders decide that Steed and Black Pete aren't really threats to anyone except probably themselves and they release them but they've sold the hostages to a mean old guy called Izzy Hands but through a bit of surprisingly effective theatre Steed tricks Izzy into giving him one of the hostages back and so we move on to what do you do with the hostage you sell him at the Pirates Republic of course well if you're Steed you force Lucius who has escaped the trunk at this point to join you in wearing matching white dandy outfits and going around the Pirates Republic yelling man for sale buy my booty but to each their own okay so the gang try and strike a deal at notorious Spanish Jackie's tavern. We learn that Jim killed Spanish Jackie's favorite husband as revenge for him killing Jim's family, and now Jim has a bounty on their head. Shenanigans in a bar brawl ensue, and Jackie uses one of her other husbands to lead the revenge into a trap set by the Spanish Navy, who sentenced Steve to death by hanging. It's not looking good, gang, but just in the nick of time, Blackbeard and his crew storm the ship, cutting Steve down from the noose. What a perfect meet cute, am I right? So our precious baby got back. Story. A super sick Steed remembers his unhappy relationship with his wife Mary, which ended with him sneaking out in the middle of the night to sail off in The Revenge. In the present, Blackbeard watches over Steed as he sleeps like a more sexy Edward Cullen. And Blackbeard and Izzy have taken over The Revenge with plans to kill the crew once repairs are done. When Steed wakes up, Blackbeard introduces himself as Ed, and Steed gives him a bit of a tour. Unlike Captain Badminton, Ed appreciates Steed's library and all his cool frilly things and is thinks they're great. And then they swap outfits like iconic gay couple Chad and Ryan from High School Musical and it is extremely cute. Their antics are cut short however by Izzy who is not in the mood for games, one because he sucks and two because the Spanish Navy is tailing the revenge. Blackbeard and Steed have a simultaneous epiphany and disguise the revenge as a lighthouse tricking the Spanish into sailing away. The next morning they strike a deal. Steed will teach Blackbeard the ways of being a gentleman and Blackbeard will teach Steed how to be a pirate. But Blackbeard tells Izzy that he in fact plans to kill Steed and to take his identity and then Izzy can take over as Blackbeard halfway through the season. Okay, so Steed, Blackbeard, Frenchie and Olu go to a very fancy party at the... <clears throat> I think I've realized that I've just been pointing at the wrong flag. There are, I think it's French people, whatever. The Spanish and the French are just here generally being nuisances through this entire show. I'm also realizing as I say that, I don't actually know whether the people on the boat are French. They just, they had French accents, I think. Maybe. 
whatever, some kind of European colonial power. It's not fun. Either way, at first, Blackbeard, bell of the ball. He's got great stories. People love him. He's enjoying it. But as Steve predicts, the crowd turns on him and Blackbeard like uses the wrong fork and the mean people, they're just really mean to him, okay? Meanwhile, um, Frenchie and Olu are running a literal pyramid scheme with the servants on the ship being all too happy to help, you know, screw over their employers by digging up all of the dirt on the party goers. Steed spills all sorts of tea and destroys everyone's relationships. Blackbeard is impressed by Steed's ability to mess with the rich people. And then they have a disgustingly romantic moment in the moonlight with a silk handkerchief that I shall be elaborating on to great length later in this video. So Blackbeard and Steed are getting <clears throat> close. Blackbeard's teaching Steed and his crew piracy 101, like how to survive a stab wound and how to psychologically terrify your opponents using community theatre. They encounter a Dutch ship and Steed wants to try his hand at a bit of, you know, theatre piracy to scare the sailors into surrendering. Steed puts on a bizarre but um, effective performance that's mostly terrifying because Lucius cuts of his own finger in the chaos. Okay, you know how I just said that Ed had this like secret plan to actually kill Steed? Um, yeah, so that's like not going well for him. Ed like can't bring himself to stab Steed, has a breakdown in the bathtub and basically admits that he killed his father and has been directly avoiding killing people ever since steed very calm for someone who just like was almost murdered forgives blackbeard and the two make their friendship official izzy however furious that blackbeard didn't go through with the whole murder plan challenges steed to a duel he stabs steed but remember steed learned from blackbeard how to survive a stab wound so he's okay uh, kind of but like other than i mean he was stabbed but like they missed the important bits, I guess. And so Izzy essentially just has to like angrily row away from the boat never to return i wish okay so the crew is getting scurvy and blackbeard is getting bored so the revenge stops at an island that just so happens to be jim's hometown so we find out jim's backstory basically after their family was murdered jim was trained to be a killer to get revenge by a nun aunt coincidentally and helpfully for the crew the orange is the new black nun aunt assassin trainer also grows oranges so no more scurvy steed trying to entertain blackbeard basically like buys a treasure map forces him to go obviously it's fake and they don't find any treasure beyond a petrified orange but blackbeard starts to feel even more feelings for steed and lucius gives him the shovel talk like the incredible son that he is is he meanwhile is being a little rat wanting revenge so goes to spanish jackie and then teams up with badminton's twin because he has a twin and they're basically like, we're gonna take down the gentleman pirate once and for all. So basically Blackbeard's ex Calico Jack crashes the revenge uh, and basically upsets the balance between the new co-captains because he is quite literally <clears throat> the absolute worst. Like maybe worse than Izzy, he ties with Izzy. I hate them both. I mean, they're great characters, but they need to stop. At first he tries to put up with Jack out of love for Blackbeard, but when Jack kills a crewman's seagull, then Steed is like, I'm gonna maroon you. And Ed's like, okay, I'm gonna leave with Jack. And then quickly returns when he realizes that Jack was working with like Izzy, Spanish Jackie, the British Navy, like the whole time. And this has all been a ruse. And so he arrives at the ship, like just in time for the British to arrive and like arrest all of them. And they lie on the deck and they touch boots and it's the most romantic thing in the world and uh, everyone is obsessed with it. Also, I just saw on TikTok, someone got a tattoo of the two boots touching. So like, I don't know, but everyone loves it basically. Captain Babbitton's twin orders Steve's execution, but Ed calls for, you've guessed it, title of the episode, Act of Grace, a legal loophole that grants pirates amnesty in exchange for serving in the British Navy for 10 years. The Navy decides we will grant Steed an act of grace only if Ed also turns away from piracy and serves the Navy for 10 years as well. And Ed does it without a second thought. It's pretty gay of you, Edward. Okay, so Ed and Steed go to pirate reform school and Ed tells Steed that the thing that makes Ed happy is you. And they kiss and they decide to run away to China together. And I am aware of the fact that if you haven't seen the show, they decide that they're in gay love, they kiss and they want to run away to China together does sound like hyperbole. Um, but it's not, that's literally what happens in the show. But Captain Badminton's twin kidnaps him, provokes an existential crisis, and then accidentally shoots himself because I guess like brother, like brother. Steed, uh, after witnessing this, um, returns to his estranged wife, uh, Mary and their children, leaving Ed to wait alone for him on the docks for hours before he basically realizes that Steed isn't coming and then rows back to the revenge by himself. And I'm sure nothing could possibly go worse than this. <laughs> 
Welcome to episode 10. Okay, so remember Mary Steed's wife? Uh, so this whole season, she's just been living honestly her best life. So she's got a boyfriend, her art career is thriving, widowhood, and never looks so good. And then her silly little husband had to come back home from the dead. So Steed basically tries to reinsert himself back into his old life. And it goes so terribly that Mary is like fully ready to actually murder him. But then they have a really nice like post-murder attempt heart to heart. And Steed realizes that he is in love with Ed. So he basically fakes his death, sails back to the revenge, only to find that his crew has been marooned by Ed because Ed is going through a breakup that was definitely Steve's fault. And he is dealing with it very badly. So yeah, at the end of season one, um, Ed is just being sad, going through a breakup. And then Izzy, as we've established the worst, provokes him enough that he reverts back to being like full emo blackbeard and also forces Izzy to eat his own toe, and then also maybe kills Lucius by like shoving him overboard. Essentially, like the pilot ended with everyone's flags like fluttering in the wind together and it was like wholesome vibes and community and we loved it. And then the finale ends with Blackbeard's flag flying solo, now complete with the bleeding heart added. So um, that's the show guys. Let's dig into some themes. Hey, it's Editing Rowan here. So I just wanted to very quickly say, I posted a little like sneak peek of this video that was just a picture of me in front of that wall of illustrations. Um, and quite a few people asked me if they could buy like a print of the illustrations, um, if I was gonna sell them. So I've actually decided to do my first ever special offer on Patreon. So anyone who signed up to uh, the $10 plus tiers on my Patreon by May 12th will uh, basically be able to get a choice of any two of the illustrations as like postcard prints uh, through in the post to them. And anyone who is a patron at any level um, by that date will also get access to the digital like download files of all 12 of the character illustrations. The details of my Patreon, as I think I said at the beginning of the video, will be in the description if you want to check that out. The special offer is live now. Um, if you want more than the two physical prints, like prints of some of the other characters as well, then just like DM me on Instagram or Twitter and we'll sort something out there. Um, but yes, this is very flattering, but I just, for the people who asked, I wanted to, I wanted to make it available. Okay, on with the video. Okay, so the show looks at this idea of an escape from society not as necessarily like a realistic view of pirate life, but a useful cinematic backdrop to explore themes of marginalization and social pressure. Because a stereotypically all male environment ruled by brutality and hardship is rife with potential to explore things like toxic masculinity, violence, and inequality. And so in this section of the video, we're gonna be digging deeper into some of these themes. Toxic masculinity. The overarching plot of the show is kind of like a cultural exchange between Steed and Ed, each teaching the other about their respective ideals of masculinity in their own worlds. Rich upper class man versus rugged hyper violent pirate. And then realizing that what makes them happy is not conforming to one or other of these roles, but creating their own sense of self and the time they spent together while discovering it. First, let's look at Steed. So he exists within the structure of colonial society, but he's bad at it. Instead of wanting to be a soldier, exploiting the socially celebrated freedom to do violence through the military or navy, he prefers gentle pursuits. He reads, he has an interest in fashion, and is ultimately condemned for it by both his peers and his father. For them, softness and emotionality are akin to weakness. There's no room for healthy male bonding, it's always in these flashbacks tied in with the ideas of aggression and brutality. There's no model for Steed of what a healthy expression of emotion looks like, and definitely not one that will be socially acceptable for him to partake in. I think a lot of queer viewers can see them themselves in Steed's experience of being bullied and harassed for something that you haven't even understood about yourself yet, let alone articulated aloud. The pack sensing something weak and wrong that seems to be obvious to them in the way that it differs from the acceptable norm, but that just feels natural to you. Even outside of his interests and hobbies, he cannot fit into the social role of husband and father, describing himself as uncomfortable in a married state. As far as we know, Steed sort of doesn't figure out that he likes men at all in a romantic way until nearly the end of the season. He's clearly been feeling this disconnect between himself and the life laid out for him, but he thinks it's because of the arranged nature of the marriage or wanting a change of scenery or pace. In this way, the sea in the show comes to represent a kind of freedom 
that he doesn't have the scope to even imagine while with his family on land. The weight and pressure of gendered expectations is most often talked about in ways it constrains women, but Steed is just as crushed by them as Mary is. They both have to remove themselves from the bonds of heteronormativity, Steed at sea and Mary as an independent widow, to understand the potential of their lives. There is something so specifically tragic about this playing out first like a midlife crisis storyline, we most often see queer coming of age stories kind of in people's teens and maybe early 20s, but that's not the case here. There are decades of unhappiness and melancholy and resignation before Steed figures out what happiness can be for him. His father was abusive and the other boys tormented him for having emotions at all. And when he finally gets to the state sanctioned covenant of marriage, where he at least is permitted to feel the emotion of love, he can't do it right. So he kind of goes off and invents this non-violent world of piracy in his head where he can have emotions and books and coincidentally be around hot guys all the time. It's a place where he isn't just accepted but celebrated for it. The gentleman pirate is a figure that he imagines is respected for having all of these things that Steed was once punished for and in that context piracy seems um pretty gay. Okay now compare that to Ed, someone who is very much excelling at you know, the violence. As a result, he is feared, he is respected, and he is an emotional wreck who talks to himself in the third person. Decades of performing these ideals of masculinity takes its toll, even on those for whom it comes more naturally. When Ed asks Steed, it's just hard sometimes, you know. You ever feel trapped, like you're just treading water waiting to drown? They're both relating to the pressures of being a man in the correct way from very different sides. One of the stats that is most often talked about in relation to modern criticisms of toxic masculinity is the high rate of suicide amongst men. A combination of many complex factors, but exacerbated by the social stigma against open emotionality and vulnerability, this is reflected in one of the earlier scenes we have of Blackbeard in the show, when he suggests, that's an idea, I haven't died yet, have I? It's talk of suicide casually, but seemingly seriously, just thrown out there. He's doing masculinity right, but it's leaving him ultimately empty. I say that the violence comes more naturally to him, but that in itself is an oversimplification. Ed doesn't enjoy threatening or subjugating others as a default. When he introduces himself to Steed's crew, he is amiable and honest, but the honesty brings out positive comments in him. He has this natural niceness, but it's trapped in the usual cycle of violence and killing, literally having discussed with Izzy, casually killing most if not all of that very same crew just moments before. Ed, we see in the show, starts to conceive of himself as two separate entities. There is Ed, the guy he is with Steed, who grows more present as the episodes go on, but then there's also Blackbeard or the Kraken, the role he plays because it is what he is supposed to do. In the episode where the two men first meet, he grasps at the chance to get to know Steed outside of the mantle of the Blackbeard persona, telling him, I guess I do work for Blackbeard instead of coming clean and actively distancing Blackbeard from himself as Ed, even passing the mantle and costume onto Bonnet. I already did a very thorough breakdown of the other gay pirate TV show, Black Sails on my channel, but I just wanted to say here, if you've seen that show, you'll know that this is a very similar character dynamic to Captain Flint in Black Sails. He sees himself as the man, James McGraw, and then the pirate, Captain Flint two separate entities. And initially, it's looking to find a way to put Flint aside so that James might find peace. But that is because James had found love and peace in the past before losing it and becoming Flint, and so can see a way to get back to it, or as close as he can, Ed, on the other hand, never had the opportunity to find peace before becoming Blackbeard. We see in flashbacks his physically abusive father, who it is then revealed was killed by Ed himself, leading directly to his becoming Blackbeard. Even though many would see the act as justified, it haunts Ed and he feels compelled to frame himself as a literal monster for having done it. He doesn't have a model for what peace looks like until he meets Steed, so he can't try and get back to it. Ed has his walls carefully stripped from him by Steed, layer by layer, and is rewarded with understanding and gentleness. After he suffered a flashback to his father's murder, he allows himself to cry in front of Steed and confesses his failed attempt to murder him. And instead of losing Steed's respect, Ed gains it. 
as Steve tells him, I'm your friend in this desperate, like heart wrenching voice. Ed is vulnerable and broken in front of this man who he has come to respect. And it's enforced to him in that moment that that's fine. In fact, it might even be a good thing. We see in the show how powerful this cycle of violence can be, especially when men are given no alternative ways to resolve their pain and trauma. Blackbeard's bloody return at the end of the first season is built on the back of Ed's pain. Steed choosing not to come with him leads Ed to the conclusion that one person who seems to care for the real him didn't like him enough to stick around. And at that point, it feels better to be the thing that everyone feared and respected rather than the man who can feel such heartache or returning to the boy he was before he knew he could commit such violence, who was merely a victim. In the last episode, when Ed becomes Blackbeard once more, he throws away a red piece of silk that we'd previously seen Steed fashion into a pocket square for him. He's had this fabric ever since he was a child. It was the first luxury luxurious thing that he ever owned. This bit of silk represents Ed's capacity for love. It is, in many ways, his heart, something he's kept hidden away from the world. It might have been safely tucked away when no one could see or touch it, but that's not what it was made for. It takes Steed to show Ed that it can be precious, even if it isn't a full bolt of fabric or made into a fancy coat already. A little heart can be enough, and it can be something that he's allowed to feel. Steve tells him, you wear fine things well in the moonlight, and it begins to knit together the love he felt as a boy for his mother, and a potential for love he thought he'd lost in the present, to give him a sense of permission to feel love in the future. It is inextricably tied to Steed, and to empathy and emotionality, and so, by the end of the season, Ed has to be rid of it because he's realizing that when you open yourself up to love and really feeling what you're going through, you might become vulnerable in a way that can't be defended by armor or swordsmanship. Ed can throw out the silk scrap and the books and the summer linens. He can even get rid of the crew that have come to mean family to Steed. But all he's doing as he cuts them from his life is carving away at the most authentic parts of himself, that he was only just allowing himself to feel. Getting rid of Lucius specifically and brutally is a marker of Ed's state of mind because Lucius was the character left on the ship that stood the best chance of bringing Ed out of his grief. And he doesn't want that. All the reminder of Steed that Lucius is. Ed knows how precarious this old feeling of anger is. Now he knows what it's like not to have to feel it all the time just to keep going. He knows how easily he could be drawn back into a world of vulnerability and love. And right now it isn't worth the risk of feeling this kind of pain again. Steed can't be the ideal of violent stoic masculinity, but Ed can and he's using it to punish himself for ever thinking that he didn't have to be. We also see these glimpses into this kind of performative or destructive masculinity in characters like Black Pete and Calico Jack. It's a kind of posturing based on ego and pretense. In these characters, the more intense toxicity is in response to insecurity and trauma. As Jack says, pirates don't have friends. We're all just at various stages each other over. It's the same weak versus strong sentiment that Steed endured as a boy, carrying through not just elite society, but all the way to the criminal underbelly of the world. These pressures and expectations of gender can reach you anywhere. Jack is the embodiment of like frat bro energy, bursting back into Ed's life with a special kind of peer pressure, the temptation of overloading yourself with immediate sensation in drinking, in violence, in risk taking, that you don't have to think about anything else. You don't have to think Think about your emotions or your worries or yourself as anything other than a piece of a ritualistic fraternal whole. He calls Ed a real pirate in comparison pointedly to the unmasculine steed. And when he kills Carl the seagull, there is no remorse, no apology, just excuses and jokes because anything else would be a weakness. Through Jack, we see part of Ed's past that helped shape him into who he is today. He went from this abusive household straight into an abusive life aboard ships like Hornigolds. Yet while with Steed, he's able to open up, be vulnerable, to cry about the pain he went through. With Jack, he's forced to laugh about it. 
They're blasé about enduring abuses together under Hornigold, and it emphasises for the audience just how much Ed has been downplaying and joking about genuinely messed up stuff. We see the more realistic portrayal of this kind of violence at the end of the show, jarring against the comedic tone of the previous episodes overall. This is something that we see in some of the best kinds of comedy I think shows or movies which are like entertaining they make you laugh but they are also able to switch into something more serious and that light-heartedness the comedy from before kind of emphasizes that seriousness rather than feeling like like it doesn't fit with it. I would say a really classic example of this that most people in the UK will probably be familiar with would be the end scene, the finale episode of Blackadder Goes Forth. You can kind of forget while watching the rest of the show that it's not just like a random historical period that you're watching Blackadder, you know, have hijinks in again, but specifically it's in like the middle of the trenches in the middle of a war. And that final episode reminds you of that in the most emotionally devastating way. And so in Our Flag Means Death, you can kind of see this parallel between the idea of like comedy and drama playing out within Ed's own like psyche. You know, this macho pretense is not who he is, not entirely because he is unable to meld together the different parts of himself to acknowledge that he can be someone who likes fine fabrics and joking around with his friends and the thrill of adventure. You know, someone with the capacity to be open and emotional without it being only in moments of complete overwhelm where the dam finally breaks. Violence. Violence in pirate media, in fact, in a lot of genres of cinema traditionally tied to white masculinity, is often seen as exciting spectacle, noble heroics, or proof of manhood. To be man without violence is not to be a man at all. Over and over in Steed's flashbacks, we see his father emphasize that violence and blood are the mark of a man, and without them, Steed is worthless. The development of violence in the show from farcical punchline to something with genuine stakes and consequences is one that's never quite complete or uncomplicated. When Steed accidentally kills Badminton in the pilot, there's a kind of dark humor there, like, oh, okay, this is a setup for the season, a mistaken identity kind of plot where people think Steed is a bloodthirsty murderer, but he's really a soft boy at heart, but he's genuinely messed up about it. And his own psychological torment over it follows him across the series, weaving between dramatic and comedic setups. It's with him all the time, whether he is feeling sadness or joy waiting just below the surface. As he faces the firing squad for his part in Badminton's death, he tells Ed, I deserve this. He genuinely believes that an accident that resulted in an awful man's death, that being unable to continue living an unhappy life when you should have stayed and put up with it, with his wife and children doing his duty, that like that should rightfully end in him dying. Violence is not portrayed as something outside of civilized society, but taking place within and being because of it. Ed reacts instinctively with a violent jerk away, having his beard touched at the high society party. There is a careless disregard and disrespect for him as an individual with agency in such a setting a kind of dehumanizing emotional violence that is met with a kind of fight or flight violence in return from Ed, if only for a moment. Compare that to the tenderness of having Steed fix his beard while they're out camping, with Steed giving him the opportunity to fix it himself and then asking permission to do it instead. It's a scene so apparent that it clues Lucius into their blossoming romantic dynamic, far from the previous beard touch earlier in the season. There is also, of course, state-sanctioned violence. The Navy employs violence against pirates and indigenous people regularly. And the show goes out of its way to not portray the British and Spanish violence as superior, just perhaps better funded. Steed too is driven to violence, not by his life on the high seas, which should stereotypically have been the catalyst for him to descend into violence, but by a return to society. When he snarls out, unhand me or bleed, we see that his violence appears when he is forced into the pretense of husband in well-to-do society. The pressure to conform and stifle himself once again becomes too much, now that he's known the kind of freedom that is possible. The show doesn't portray violence as the default state of humanity, which only civil society can rectify. In fact, it suggests quite the opposite, that underneath it all, without the trauma and the pressure, the characters in the show are mostly just good people. Steed isn't changing Ed and the crew of the revenge with his kindness and attempts at group therapy. He's revealing them. European and colonial society, by contrast, is restrictive, warmongering, and indifferent to suffering. Violence is, in some ways, a pretense. Blackbeard's violence re-emerges as a reaction to heartbreak and loss, but he still cries when he's alone. He says, I am the Kraken, as more of an affirmation than a confession. 
The violence itself is for show, for others and for himself, but it can still have very real consequences. As Steve says, I've been the cause of death, it changes you forever. Izzy is happy at Blackbeard's violent return because it's the only form of respect that he knows. If a captain is violent, then he's a real man, he's powerful, he's driven. And if that show of violence is there, then you don't have to go through vulnerability because your suffering is enduring the physical pain and that's easier to bear. And then there's the scene where Ed teaches Steed how to survive a stab wound by forcing Steed to actually stab him, goading him on, threatening to shoot him, and then laughing when he does it. Izzy overhears the moaning as Steed tries to pull his blade out of Ed's torso and assumes it's sexual. And you know what? Izzy's kind of not wrong. It's intimacy expressed in a funhouse mirror version of the socially acceptable moment of male confrontation. We know from Jack that Ed isn't opposed to sex with another man, but he isn't used to the emotional romantic intimacy that a relationship with Steed is headed towards. So he replaces it with what he knows, the intimacy of direct combat, of teaching him tricks he's learned over the years, of bringing him close and trusting him enough to be physically vulnerable. It's like the most intense version of that bizarre gay trope where men have to punch each other before they're allowed to kiss on screen. But like this time the punching is like actively consensual and with swords, I guess. Okay, so at this point in the video, I just wanted to let you in on a little secret behind the scenes style. Um, I have a very bad memory and also don't have a teleprompter like normal, professional, smart people might do when they have to read a 15,000 word script to camera in one go. So instead, I use a theatre technique called recorded delivery using a recording that I made of the script being fed to me through an earbud. Uh, and what better sponsor to have for my longest scripted video to date than said earbuds themselves, the everyday earbuds from Raycon that have honestly been a dream to record with this entire time. They came with a bunch of sizes of gel tips so I could choose the most comfortable fit for my ears specifically and means that even when I'm energetically pretending to be a pirate on the deck of the revenge while listening to the chain on repeat for an hour, they still stay in place. I'm pretty sure YouTube would remove me just playing the actual song, The Chain, but um, I guess have this royalty-free uh, example instead. They offer eight hours of playtime and a 32 hour battery life, which I'm going to need if I want to film this entire script in one day. You can get quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands backed up by over 48,000 five-star reviews. So if you're looking for some new earbuds with a cheeky discount and would like to help support my channel then click the link in the description or go to buyraycon.com forward slash rowan to get 15% off your raycon purchase revenge similarly to the exploration of violence our flag means death also links thematically over and over to the idea of revenge i mean steed's ship is literally called the revenge although that feels maybe more like a silly little boy naming a ship something that sounded cool not realizing how fitting it would become. The revenge plot as a story is a popular one with a long history, tied to older ideas of honor and continuing to be popular in a kind of like unfulfilled fantasy way. Most of us never get to do a vengeance ourselves anymore. So revenge in fiction is justice, it's fair, it's the great motivator. And a lot of the time it's being sought by justified protagonists or else it's an antagonist going too far, seeking revenge outside of the acceptable levels of violence disproportionate to the original offence. We get classic kinds of revenge narratives in the stories of Jim and Jackie and Steed and Badminton's brother. When we find out about Jim's quest to avenge their family's deaths, it's something put on them by external forces, the nun who took Jim in and taught them to fight. We also find out that left to their own devices, they've only killed one of the gang responsible. It is in many ways a cycle of violence that Jim has been raised into rather than one that they chose for themselves. The decision to stay in St. Augustine and leave the crew, especially Olu, is ultimately not the right one. Jackie herself gives the show's seeming thesis on the concept of revenge itself, telling Jim, you can't end up like me. All the revenge, the rage, the anger, it ages you. A warning on how these things can negatively impact you and not just the people that you're pursuing. It's played in a style typical of the show with humor, as Jackie reveals that she is in fact in her 20s, such as the aging and damaging effect on her health. But the more serious message is there below the surface. 
who does this actually help? How is this justice and where does it stop? Babington's brother's obsession with revenge for his brother's death means he's unable to conceive of Steed as a human being anymore. You're a monster, a plague, you defile beautiful things. It's this capacity for dehumanization that allows you to be driven to do awful things for the sake of revenge that justify to yourself any means and any ends. And playing these two storylines of Jim and Babington's brother alongside each other is an interesting one because ultimately they're both looking for the same thing thing, a kind of violent justice for the death of their family. I saw someone comment as a criticism of the show that they set up Jim to go on this big revenge quest and then they just decided to leave and go back to the crew, but that's kind of the point, right? Class, race and empire. Okay, so the choice to explore or ignore real life issues in historical media is a complex one. The catch with the historically accurate trump card of showing that people who weren't, you know, cis, straight, white, able-bodied men did actually exist and have agency before the 21st century is that their reality was one inevitably affected by the power structures that made that the false idea of history in the first place. Bridgerton has been criticized since its first season for stumbling at this hurdle, creating a supposed like race-blind alternate world with a black queen of England, only to reveal that in a kind of like half-hearted way, like, oh, racism does actually exist in this world, by the way. And for many viewers, not doing a great job of satisfying either premise in the process. Our flag means death, on the other hand, doesn't do race-blind casting. It specifically includes plot lines and counters and backstories for its characters of color that match with the kind of treatment that they might expect at the time. But it also gives them a sense of agency that matches with the tone of the show, as well as storylines outside of those areas. I think we're pretty used to trauma as a narrative motivator in our media today because the idea is that compelling stories are about the most important thing to happen to that character in their life. Like that's the reason why you're telling that character's story at that time. And there is this idea that that has to be trauma, right? And in many cases that trauma has to be shown on screen and for marginalized characters, their marginalization must be involved. Like this concept is nothing new. If you look up the term like misery porn as a huge part of the representation of marginalized people, like it's the reason that so many films about black people that are made and especially celebrated are slavery narratives. And although there are obviously some amazing like TV shows and movies that deal with this premise of like marginalized trauma, a lot of the time, you know, narratives that don't do it so well are either going to end with this kind of like abject misery or a kind of didactic lesson for the non-marginalized audience. For a comedy especially, it would seem jarring to enmesh the characters in such trauma, but the very premise of a bunch of black, brown, queer, poor pirates set during a time of colonial rule means that there was a decision to be made about how to balance these elements. The show decides to deal with it by making the colonial powers and people the punchline themselves pretty much every time. It's something Taika Waititi himself has spoken on. I think any colonial country is ripe fodder for comedy. Someone mentioned, oh, you make fun of cultures. And I said, what cultures? And they went, the British. And I was like, oh, I'm cool with that. He's of course no stranger to taking horrific times and characters from history and giving them a humorous spin. Himself, a Jewish man playing Hitler in Jojo Rabbit as a comedic, like imaginary friend figure to a young German boy. Where some people feel uncomfortable about the idea of laughing at this kind of tragedy, his method of using humor to reveal a kind of pathetic weakness at the heart of powerful villains is one that many have found cathartic. We see in the party scene where the gathered aristocrats excite themselves over the idea of the study of the human skull a classic racist area of study, uh, that those in this position of social power see themselves as logical. This is order, this is science, this is truth, but by placing the marginalized as the straight man in these setups and having the oppressor characters as the butt of the joke, or the ones that are so obviously in the wrong, you have the chance to expose their supposed truths as unfounded reality. Like the things that they think are logical are in fact entirely laughable. The veneer of civilization has been criticized many times through literature, in books like Lord of the Flies, for example. But in many of these explorations, the idea is often that society is the only thing stopping the ultimately savage nature of humanity from running rampant. The show itself is kind of saying the opposite in many ways. Just look at the relative equality on Steed's ship with good wages compared to the stark racism and classism of the British civilized sailors. Badminton's brother has to ask for the state's permission to kill Steed because violence is something that civilization supports if it's against the right people. And we see 
see in the scenes of indigenous populations that European civilization does this violence at levels of brutality and magnitudes that is incomparable to individual pirates or criminals. I don't think it's an accident that Ed and Steed are able finally to dream of running away together while in plain tunics, free of the uniforms of their respective lives. Freedom is tied to a releasing of expectations and pressures tied to class and station. Because class is a fundamental part of Ed and Steed as characters. It reveals their strengths and their insecurities. Ed is fascinated at first by Steed's fine clothes and fancy ship, but it also becomes a source of insecurity, an unspoken question, am I good enough for him? Steed is this upper-class gentleman, but he's also ostracized from that society and doesn't attempt to act as a savior or civilizer to the other characters either. He's kind of clueless. There's a kind of pressure in the labeling of him as a stupid little rich boy and his journey of becoming a captain as trying to figure out what he can be outside of that. Except in this first season, he is using his family money to fund this attempt at being his own person. It's not until the very final scenes of the show that we see him with even that support removed from under him, giving up his family money and the clothes and books it affords him to return to Ed in the same plain tunic that symbolise them as equals removed from the trappings of society. So it'll be interesting to see if in season two they deal with him being a silly little not so rich boy anymore instead. The privileges of Steed's birth are not lost on us as an audience. The fact is that the gentleman pirate is only able to be so useless because he has his family fortune. He uses that for good, you know, to pay his crew, but it is itself a privilege for him to have the luxury to be able to not take prizes or risk violence at first. Ollie tells him we're pirates because we don't have a choice. The rest of them are criminal servants, potentially even former slaves, who don't have the acreage that Steve does to support them in having adventures. The illiteracy of most of the crew is pointed out often, most often in passing or as a handy plot point, but it's another untapped source of tension and development that I would love to see dug into next season. It's of course impossible to talk about the way this show handles class and I'll also talk about the way it deals with how that intersects with race. It's an unsurprising move from this particular creative team but the show is careful to ensure that Steed doesn't like civilize the crew. His therapist-esque techniques are not learned from society but are in fact made up of ways that he himself learned to deal with how it treated him badly. He doesn't force the crew into like a My Fair Lady style makeover, even though he clearly, you know, has enough clothes from them all to do so. Instead, only giving them the upper class clothes and training when it literally is a life or death situation trying to fool the British Navy. In the episode where Olu and Frenchie pose as the crown prince of Egypt and his viceroy in order to scam the aristocrats, their pretended class status can't protect them from racism. But it's pointed that while the supposed friends at the party end the evening tearing each other's throats out and their ship burning down, Olu and Frenchie form a bond with Abshir and the other workers on the ship, helping each other and ultimately you know, leaving the ship burning in their wake while the people who used to be serving on the ship itself are able to sail away safely with all of their riches. Storytelling and performance. Ed and Steed's character arcs revolve around their relationship to storytelling, but in very different ways. The show associates Steed with the written word, books, plays and journals. Meanwhile, Ed is tied to oral storytelling and theatrical performance. Let's start with Steed. So at some point in Steed's childhood, he began to read books about pirates. He became obsessed with these stories about adventurous men living beyond social norms, norms that Steed struggled to meet. As I mentioned before, Steed's parents and peers constantly made him feel like he wasn't man enough. And so as a coping mechanism, Steed became a romantic. And I mean that in the worst way possible. Like through the distance of his book, Steed romanticized a life of violence, a life that, as Olu points out, nobody besides Steed actually chose. And this romanticization damages Steed's ability to perceive reality. In the first episode, he groups himself with Olu as being like born to piracy. And that's in part due to the fact that Steed doesn't want to be a real pirate. He wants to be born to be a fictional one. He keeps creating this character of the gentleman pirate by, you know, taking credit for Babington's murder, trying to establish brand recognition at the Pirates Republic with matching costumes and making Lucius give him grand scripted introductions. 
He even hires Liu Xiu as a scribe to literally turn his life into a written story. In fact, a lot of Steed's piracy choices are book related. He builds a library in his quarters, he loots books from other ships, he reads aloud to the crew. In the first episode, Steed reads the story of Pinocchio to his crew. Pinocchio is, you know, a lying puppet who wants to be a real boy. And after several misadventures involving you know, being swallowed by a whale, the blue fairy grants Pinocchio his wish and makes him real. Steed, like Pinocchio, is not perceived to be a real boy or real man. When he meets Blackbeard, Steed sees a blue fairy, someone who can make him real. Replace the word pirate with man and think about the conversations between Steed and Ed. I'm not a real pirate. I'm a terrible pirate. I'll teach you the ways of being a pirate. Steed's read stories about Blackbeard and in his mind, the fictionalized book version of Blackbeard with his nine guns is real. Steed seeks this realness through his relationship with Blackbeard and ironically, by fictionalizing his own life. And it kind of works, I guess. In the penultimate episode, Badminton's evil twin dismisses Steed's plea for an act of grace because act of grace only applies to real pirates. But Lucius saves Steed by reading from his log. The exaggerated written version of Steed's piracy lead the Navy to turn on Babington's twin and deem Steed a real pirate. By the end of the season, Steed faked it until he made it. Very Anna Delvey of him. Now let's talk about Ed. So Ed doesn't have the luxury of literacy, but he is very good at theatrical performances and storytelling. That includes the stories he tells about himself and the ones told about him by others. Remember, the first time we meet Blackbeard is through Black Pete's totally fake story in episode two. But whether it's performance or storytelling, Ed uses this narrative to dehumanize himself. In his story, Black Pete describes a smoke-faced monster with glowing eyes. And Ed himself uses smoke and wires to create the appearance of apparition and levitation to much the same effect. But Ed's dehumanization through storytelling is most obvious with the Kraken story. Steed and Ed are telling ghost stories to the crew, paralleling Steed reading to the crew in the first episode. It's very cute. It's like Ed is the Revenger's new stepdad. Steed's ghost story obviously sucks. Ed, however, tells a horrifying story about how he, as a child, saw the Kraken kill his father. Later in the episode, after failing to kill Steed, Ed confesses that he killed his father. He is the Kraken. He turned himself into a monster as a way to distance himself from the violence he committed. Likewise, Ed created Blackbeard as this kind of separate entity as a way to protect himself while being the pirate that he needs to be to survive. By the time we meet Ed, the pressure of constantly performing as Blackbeard has taken its toll. Within a few minutes of talking to him, Ed plots to kill his Blackbeard identity and assume Steed's instead. But as he falls in love with Steed, Ed realizes that he can let go of the Blackbeard persona and just be himself instead of assuming another identity. In Act of Grace, Ed, now freshly shaven, feels relief not just at ending his performance as Blackbeard, but at rediscovering what it means to be Ed. For the first time in decades, he's not working for Blackbeard. He can just be himself and he can focus on what makes Ed happy. But Steed isn't quite there yet. Even though he accepts Ed's proposal to go live their best gay lives in China, there's still a sense of unease. Steve's upset to see that Ed has shaved his beard, saying you can't be Blackbeard without the beard. Ed, on the other hand, is totally at peace with the decision. It's Steed that finds it unnerving. Ed points out Blackbeard itself was a misnomer, like his beard hasn't been black since he was way younger. When Badminton's twin forces Steed to walk into the woods at gunpoint and accuses him of being a fraud who ruins everything he touches, including Blackbeard, Steed agrees. At this point, he doesn't see Ed letting go of the Blackbeard performance as a victory. He sees it as a failure. In the last episode, we see Steed and Ed swap methods of storytelling. Steed successfully pulls off a theatrical performance and fakes his death, killing off his original identity and retiring to a life of piracy. It shows how much Steed has learned from Blackbeard, his fake death mirroring Ed's original plan for them both. And Ed turns towards written storytelling in the form of songwriting. He teams up with Lucius to write down lyrics for his breakup song. He's having a very red era Taylor Swift moment. Before, Ed used storytelling as a form of disguise and deception. But in this scene with him dictating lyrics, it's the first time he's used storytelling as a method of self-reflection and self-expression. But of course, this moment doesn't last. When Izzy shoves Steed's pirate book in Ed's face, claiming 
you know, the inaccurate drawing shows the real Blackbeard, Ed regresses. He puts on the eyeliner, makes Izzy eat some toes and throws all the books and Lucius into the sea. He completely rejects the written form of storytelling by removing art as a means of self-expression. He's once again distancing his real self from the person he needs to be to survive. Because right now being Ed is far too painful. Found family. So found family as a trope and as a real life experience is very queer. By definition, found family opposes the extreme individualism of toxic masculinity, where emotional connection to other people and also yourself are a weakness. From a group ready to mutiny any second to a cohesive crew jumping to their captain's defense, the ensemble cast of the show become a classic example of this trope by the end of the 10 episodes. Honestly, this entire thing may just have been Steed's elaborate plan to make friends. And you know what? It worked. Rewatching the show, you really appreciate even more how the crew's relationship with Steed and each other is so contrasted from the start to the end of just this short season. In episode three, Jim literally tells Steed, you're the worst <laughs> pirate captain in history. Besides Olu and Jim, nobody on the crew trusts each other at all. But slowly these walls start to break down, initially through Steed's facilitating a kind of radical community support that the others find confusingly at odds with the cynical and unhealthy emotional lives that they've been living. He regularly runs a kind of onboard group therapy, encouraging them to communicate and share their emotions. In a parallel storyline, we found out later in the show that his estranged wife Mary has found her own similar community of widows, as well as finding herself without Steed. She was happier with him gone, quite honestly, but that isn't a bad thing. Rewatching also gave a particularly depressing twist on the joke delivery of, you know, if someone comes home from the raid mentally devastated, we talk it through as a crew. Knowing that there is a lot of um, mental devastation coming for Ed, but, you know, talking it through as a crew um, doesn't really happen. Like maybe Ed should have been in that class. There's a real sense of fun amongst the group with them all joining in group activities and eventually enjoying these schemes together. And it's not just a general sense of community and found family. The show goes out of its way to demonstrate specifically queer support. The crew have a space where they feel not just accepted in their queerness, but appreciated because of it. Lucius is able to use his experience as a kind of matchmaker between Steed and Ed in his own upfront way, calling Ed a middle-aged sad sack who will die alone if he doesn't go after Steed. And then as a sort of anti-wingman too, saying, oh, I'm good at breakups just as supportively. Olu literally says that he can be Jim's family, offering the same unconditional love and support that Jim had lost so many years ago. This is backed up by the rest of the crew who are curious about Jim's disguise, but after some questions quickly slip into using the right name and pronouns. We also see how Steed doesn't fit into his old life anymore. The community he's built, the family he's found on the ship, as well as this newly discovered queer identity makes him happier than the heterosexual life he was forced into. Look, the, the sea is gay, the land is straight. I will not elaborate and I do not make the rules. And it's not just an overarching family dynamic. Specifically, we see a kind of parenting dynamic from Ed and Steed towards the crew. I mean, Steed literally reads them bedtime stories with fun voices. He models what good and fair parenting should be in contrast to the abusive fathers both he and Ed endured as children. The moment that we see he has put all of the flag designs up on the mast is so precious because we understand that the group doesn't need to be encouraged to compete with each other, but to respect each other, to be treated as equals. After Steed wakes up, you know, the first time that he almost dies, the first thing he asks about is his crew, like the very first thing, and that's early in the season. It's embedded in him by that point to care about them as a priority. And then when Ed and Steed break up after Ed leaves with Jack, he treats the crew like kids in the middle of a divorce. You know, neither of us will love you any less. This isn't your fault. This echoing of familiar cliche parental phrases is in some ways about the humor of the situation on the surface, grown adults acting like messy teenagers or petulant toddlers. But it's also a genuine demonstration of the familial ties that are weaving their way through the group. It's undeniable that one of the key reasons why this show has become so popular so quickly is its numerous queer characters and the way that the word of mouth has spread about the fact that this slow burn doesn't end in queer baiting. So for that reason, it felt like it would be a misstep to not do a section of this video deep diving into some of these characters specifically and how they're handled in the show. Jim. 
So Jim's an unusual character for television in that they are a live action non-binary character played by a non-binary actor. We're seeing non-binary rep increasing, but only by fractions. So it's always great when we see it in such a central character, especially one that the actor themselves seems so excited about. One of the great things about the show is the fact it makes clear the distinction between women dressing as men to avoid, you know, the powerlessness and sexism of the era and an actual non-binary or trans character. Both are, of course, possibilities. And I know that a lot of people are hoping for an Anne Bonny or Mark Mary Reed cameo next season, which can play into this idea even more. What seemed to have started as a way to escape from Jackie's vengeance becomes a way for Jim to explore and understand themselves and their gender better, with it becoming a more solid part of their identity by the end of the season. I think it's really significant and very exciting that although Jim initially has this disguise that helps them kind of figure out some stuff about gender because they you know, the way that other people perceive them, the way that they feel with this kind of disguise on um, and how those things interact with each other. The show then allows Jim to like throw the disguise away and to still be validated and still be kind of seen as non-binary by themselves, by the crew and by the audience. Like Jim's gender expression externally does not have to have anything to do with their gender presentation outwardly. And the show also gives Jim a backstory separate from their gender, made even more unusual by the fact that we get an exploration of that backstory in the same season as Jim is figuring out how they want to identify. The show is like, turns out queer people can have more than one thing going on at the same time. You know, they don't just stop so they can have a big queer crisis. When asked, so this whole time you were a woman, they respond, yes, I guess. I don't know. Eventually, in no uncertain terms, how they want the others to think about them as Jim still. And that's pretty much that. Jim also gets a romance in this season. A lovely friends to lovers, awkward, flirty, slow burn, cuteness that is chef's kiss. At no point does Olu have a crisis about like, what does this mean if I like Jim? Oh my God, so fraught, so complex. He's just like, oh no, I like my friend. Are we gonna kiss though, please? That's not to say that the figuring out of your sexuality when you fall for someone whose identity is shifting isn't something that makes for interesting stories, but it's great to see a lack of drama around a non-binary person being seen as desirable, especially given the show does such a great job of never making someone's desirability a joke or a surprise, whether they are like queer, fat, gender non-conforming or otherwise. Black Pete and Lucius. So I was fully ready to hate Black Pete, but they really went full out on this kind of quiet character development in the background that ends with him still being an annoying little man, but with such silly tenderness at the same time that you kind of can't help but like him. He is so obviously affected by that kind of toxic masculinity posturing that I talked about earlier in the video, but I loved how they didn't tie it in with like insecurities and violence put on by internalized homophobia. I've just seen way too many of that like homophobic sexist bully is actually gay trope to be able to handle that again, especially as they paired him with the openly queer ray of sunshine that is Lucius. The fact that the show makes Lucius's cuteness and femininity desirable and not laughable, it's depressingly rare to be honest. And when they get together later in the season, there's an interesting reflection of the development that Pete has been going through since the first episode, where he postures about like the feminine women's work of sewing being something to be derided. like. It's growth, people, we're seeing growth. That same breaking down of heteronormativity and gender roles is continued through their storyline with confirmation that they're happily polyamorous. When Izzy tries to blackmail Lucius by revealing to Pete that he's been drawing the crew naked in an attempt to ruin his reputation and relationship, Pete just thinks it's like cool. The declaration, we don't own each other, very much gives us non-heteronormative relationship vibes a legitimate relationship that gives them both freedom that they both want. It's also a relationship where they see each other's flaws. Lucius literally saying, I love that man, but leadership's not his strength. He knows Pete is prone to exaggeration and posturing and he just sees right through it because he also gets to see the same man whittle a prosthetic finger just for him or share casual pet names with each other like Sweetie and Babe or reach out to cuddle during the night sleeping on deck. The show's choice to have a canon on-screen queer couple from around the halfway point, I think particularly played off for viewers worried that the Steed Ed relationship would be an end of season plot twist or queer bait situation. And I think that the ending for Lucius this season, especially in many other shows, would not have been given the benefit of the doubt it has been by the fandom so far. 
I can see other shows pulling a like Lucius overboard moment and the think pieces about like the bury your gaze trope kind of write themselves. But there is such trust in the writers of this show that everyone watching just kind of went, wow, I wonder what will happen when Lucius is fished out of the sea totally alive, huh? I am personally a huge fan of the theory that he managed to catch the side of the ship on his way down and has been hiding in the secret passages that Steed put into the ship this entire time. Steed and Ed. Do you like enemies to friends to lovers romance? The wearing each other's clothes trope, emotional confessions in the moonlight, grumpy gruff boy falls for sunshine child, slow burn pairing. Might I interest you in Steed and Ed or Stead? Black Steed, Steadwood, Gentlebeard, I don't know whether we've settled on a ship name yet. Ed and Steed are the almost quintessential idea of opposites attract, with the plot itself hinging on them exploring and appreciating their differences and learning from each other. They see the positives in each other that they can't see in themselves. One of the most delightful things about their relationship is how many tropes it employs. Like, dude, is it gay to tend to your wounds and watch your sleeping face wishing I could know you and soothe your nightmares? You also have the sharing each other's clothes thing, which is again, very Chad and Ryan. The whole enemies to friends slash friends to lovers thing. Like, I meant to kill you, but I can't bring myself to. Amazing. There's also a scene where Steed knows how Ed takes his tea, which I feel very domestic intimate knowledge. And of course the whole Jack plot line is just like an ex-boyfriend coming to town to make the love interest jealous. But the show also continually subverts and plays with expectations and tropes too. At the start, you could easily assume that the more emotionally expressive Steed would be the one pining after Ed and Ed would lag behind and have to begrudgingly be dragged into love. But in the end, it's essentially the opposite with Ed realizing his feelings first and Steed having to literally abandon all that makes him happy to go back to the life he should lead to realize that like, it's been love all along. I talked earlier about the red silk being a physical manifestation of Ed's love, but I think there's another reading I find just as interesting. This scrap from his mother is a reminder of his low class status and the distance he feels that creates between himself and soft and beautiful things. What draws him to Steed and the fancy party is that he desires that life for himself, but it doesn't feel like a part of him. It doesn't feel like it fits until Steed incorporates it effortlessly into his outfit, showing Ed that Steed doesn't see him as unworthy of that kind of beauty, but that he in fact is that kind of beauty in Steed's eyes. When he says you wear fine things well, Steed is telling Ed, this scrap that symbolizes what you thought you couldn't have is in fact something that fits you perfectly. In this way, when he lets it go in the season finale, he's letting go of the hope he had for a better life beyond the desperation and injustice he suffered so far. The irony of course being that Steed, a man who's wished for love his entire life, has always been told that love is for peasants. In a way, it makes total sense that the red silk has both of these meanings and for both of them to be seen as positive to Steed when they are such negatives to Ed. And speaking of metaphors and motifs, um, we need to talk about the lighthouse. So, you know, it starts as a symbol of this kind of, you know, disconnect between Mary and Steed with her thinking of it as a romantic anniversary gift and him thinking that it's something that the children painted. And then it's this plot point focused around Ed and Steed's compatibility, their bonding, using its inspiration to save the day in episode four. As Ed points out, you want to stay away from lighthouses as they signal danger. And so by the end of the season, the painting's significance changes for a third time. It remains the one thing of Steed's that Ed keeps on the ship in the final episode, not as a nostalgic reminder of their time working together, but as a physical manifestation of the idea that you stay away from lighthouses for your own safety. In keeping it, Ed is reminding himself every day why he has to be Blackbeard again, to keep himself from being dashed on the rocks that are Steed Bonnet. This show really feels like a slow burn, but you kind of have to remind yourself that the whole thing is less than a dozen episodes. And from when Steed and Ed actually meet to the kiss is what, like five episodes? And their relationship develops like with every single episode. It's always progressing in some way. The concept of show don't tell is an interesting one in storytelling. The idea that instead of stating something aloud, you should instead, or as well as, have it shown in the character's actions. The interesting thing about this as a screenwriting philosophy is that it's um, the perfect recipe for queer baiting when used badly. Because queer fans will see a movie or a TV series apparently showing and think, well, they don't have to tell right away, right? Like, 
this is subtle, this is just nuanced storytelling when really it's just queer baiting and the tell is never going to come. But when the tell does arrive and we get on-screen undoubtable confirmation, the showing can be that much more impactful. It takes on new meaning. Like when Ed confesses to a murder that he didn't commit to try and get Steed off the charges, we see him signing onto a 10 year sentence for Steed to follow him in his banishment. So when we get to the scene where Ed confesses right now, I just want to do what makes Ed happy, so I reckon what makes Ed happy is you, and makes a plan to run away together, it doesn't feel out of the blue, even though it still surprised some queer fans who are used to being burned by teased relationships that never come to fruition. I think because of this very trust being rewarded, what happens next hasn't put queer viewers off the show, right? The breakup happens almost immediately after they get together. We don't actually get to see them as like a happy couple, and yet, people have been feeling hopeful because of how the relationship was handled through earlier episodes. They didn't just end with Steed leaving on a big sad cliffhanger, they let us see beyond that to the tipping point of him realising that he loves Ed and going to get him back. The montage of Ed and Steed scenes over Mary's description of love, about showing each other new things, laughing a lot, passing the time together well, is so wonderfully done because um, not only is it, you know, a very cute montage, but it also affirms like all of the showing that queer audiences picked up on, but that we've been punished for doing in other actually queer baiting shows. Like, hey, you remember all those scenes that you looked at and went, that's pretty gay, but I don't know if they'll go there. Like, no, they were, those were all gay. Here, here they are in like a single montage validating everything that you were thinking. The return of Blackbeard at the end of the first season is such a devastating but also kind of exciting conclusion. It gets us to a point of real tension and conflict with Steed and Ed both having gone through huge emotional transformations over the course of the show. The stakes have risen and we really have no idea how it will all play out and what the reunion will look like. I think it was particularly smart of the writers to leave a lot of the ending ambiguous. We don't know, for example, if part of Ed's descent back into Blackbeard is because he hears of Steed's apparent death. If that's the case, then killing Lucius wasn't just about removing the person who could potentially bring him out of his anger and sadness, but also potentially about punishing the person who made him want to open up to that love and vulnerability in the first place. But I mean, we also don't know if Lucius is alive or not, I guess, technically. And we also have no real idea of how much time passed within the events of that final episode either. I mean, these questions all allow for a lot of freedom going into season two. And I hope they use it with the support they've had so far from the queer community in mind. I don't necessarily think that they would screw us over, but you know, Killing Eve is looming large in people's minds of late. The future of the show. At this point, there is already a huge campaign for the show to be renewed and judging by its popularity, like it would be ridiculous for them not to come back for at least another season. I know I joked at the start about the show's creator not knowing queer baiting was a thing, but I did then just spend the rest of the video talking about how great the show is. So like, I'm not trying to dunk on him, but I will say just now that him and Tiger have said some stuff that makes me go like, please, my dudes, hire a queer PR person or comms person to help you with these answers please stop saying answers from the book of like straight people make a gay movie cliche interview quotes like Jenkins saying we aren't saying this is a gay pirate show this is a pirate show and that's it when like my dude the main reason people are watching the show is because it very much is a gay pirate show or with TT saying I think people probably don't expect it to ever happen because they're used to the Mulder and Scully relationships where it's just we're never going to let you see this even though it's all very obvious what we want to do somehow using the only time straight people ever got baited instead of like comprehending it as a genuine and disproportionate specific issue of queer representation. It feels a little short-sighted, lads. I really hope they continue to like listen to the queer people in their cast and crew and the fans who have championed it to such heights with their enthusiasm and word of mouth wildfire. The first season was so good precisely because it didn't have any hints at uh, these kind of awkward interview missteps that we've seen since. So with season two all but confirmed, people have been mining any and all information they can find on the real lives of the pirates in the show for like clues as to future storylines. 
I know probably more than the average person about this group of pirates in particular. I'd say uh, entirely because of my ridiculous black sails obsession. So it's been my favorite thing seeing people find out like all of the little touches in the show, like the joke about Blackbeard being annoyed that he's being portrayed in the book with like a scary smoke man with eight guns because he just has the normal amount of guns. Like it's even funnier when you know literally any of the absolutely buck wild stories about Blackbeard. Like, oh boy, Ed is gonna have to deal with a lot more where that's coming from. Also seeing people find out that Blackbeard and Steed Bonnet died a year after the events of season one. Let's hope that doesn't happen, I guess. I'm specifically waiting in future seasons for them to do something kind of subversive with the Blackbeard's death mythology because that is, um. A great story. We also see Blackbeard's flag get completed by the end of this season with the addition of the heart that I know a lot of us were interested to see appear at some point. Now, I know like uh, history is contentious and some people are like, well, actually that wasn't technically Blackbeard's flag, but like this is the flag everyone knows as Blackbeard's flag. Um, and so I know a lot of us who knew that were looking at his flag at the beginning of the season, like, hmm, there seems to be something missing and we're very excited for it to be revealed by the end. And it also leaves us with the question of when Steed will raise his own historical flag because, um, Look at it, it's gonna be good. There's also the real life pirates that mirror Jim's story in many ways and served as inspiration on the show, like Mark or Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. In a world with like very rigid rules about like gendered clothing, they dressed as like men or as women, sort of just as it suited them. And there are definitely fun storylines to be had with characters who are some combination of like, you know, trans, non-binary, disguised and or in drag for various reasons. I'm personally a big fan of the theory that Anne Bonny will be a teen girl who ends up as a kind of adopted daughter to Ed and Steed. This is based on absolutely nothing, no evidence, just what I think would be a fun dynamic. And I know that she was partners with Calico Jack in real life, but like he is the worst on this show. And also Anne and Jack from Black Sails will always be the best queer platonic soulmate version of those two historical figures. So I am rooting for an alternative. The history of gay pirates. Okay, so I'm about to take you all on a brief roller coaster ride that, like Space Mountain at Disneyland Paris, might leave you kind of disappointed and in a bit of pain, I guess. Um, so in the aftermath of the show's release and while popularity, a lot of articles have sprung up claiming that the show is like reflecting a kind of realistic queerness within the world of pirates. Users have been excitedly sharing Tumblr posts about something called a French word I can't pronounce. Basically a form of gay marriage invented by buccaneers, commenters furiously typing in triumph, you know, like I knew it, finally queer history on screen, take that heteros. But at the risk of being the party pooper that bursts all the balloons and pisses in the gift bags, um, the image being painted of pirate life as some kind of queer utopia is not exactly the case. Like, okay, let's look at the gay pirate marriage thing. So there are very few written documents and only a handful of anecdotes like from the time around this practice. From what we can tell, um, there's like one particular record from a French buccaneer saying that it was something that happened in the Caribbean whereby two men would agree to certain ties between them, including like inheritance, um, speaking and making decisions on the other's behalf, um, sharing space on the ship, joining each other's assets for kind of mutual economic gain. He then expanded that it was a general and solemn custom to seek out for a comrade or companion. This is one interpretation or account, and we do know that there are some inaccuracies that we can prove in his account cross-referencing with other writings. So he thought, for example, that this was a practice exclusive to buccaneers in the French Caribbean, when we know one of the most kind of preserved written documents of such an arrangement was in Madagascar between two men, Francis Hood and John Beavis. That arrangement designated that what gold, silver or any other thing will go to the surviving man should the other die at sea. But yeah, basically in the documents we have, there's not really ever any mention of romantic or sexual relationships specifically between the men in these arrangements, but the documents don't preclude one either. Um, most likely most of these arrangements were kind of just, you know, not by design a form of official queer companionship, but an economic and social arrangement that could have been used to solidify sexual and romantic interests of 
individual cases. There are a few other records that have survived, including one written by a man in such a relationship himself. This is a fascinating example as it involves a former black slave, Equiano, in an extremely fond relationship with a man baker who was a white American from a slave owning family. Uh, Equiano wrote that the two were inseparable from the time they met as teenagers and went through many sufferings together on shipboard and would spend their nights laying in each other's bosoms during times of great distress. Clearly, there was a reciprocal emotional bond between the two, but this was the length to which the physicality in the book is described. The formal union was in place for two years, but they seemed to have continued their bond for the rest of their lives on an emotional level. Thus, such a friendship was cemented between us as we cherished till his death, which to my very great sorrow happened in the year 1759. Is it gay marriage? It's not a no, it's not a yes either. There really wasn't the same expressible language for it at the time. Whereas like gay and homosexual are more modern inventions and surviving documents at the time were much more likely to use criminalizing language like buggery than something neutral or tied to identity in any way. And even if there were definitive and recognizable ways to describe queerness as we now know it, this was also a time when being a man in a sexual relationship with another man was punishable by like imprisonment or death in basically the entire world. That kind of fear is inevitably going to have a censoring effect on any more permanent written documentation. And that's if the men could read and write enough to make a record that could survive at all. Sorry, I'll stop pissing in everyone's conflicts now, if you've watched some videos on my channel before, you'll probably know that like the questions of like queer history, how we discover it, how we document it, um, like the difficulties of that is something that I am very passionate about. And so when I see kind of articles being shared with people like without sources uh, or like the source is another article, like it just keeps going around in a circle. Um, I wanna do some digging, I wanna fact check, and that is what what I have found. Like, I get it, the Pirates are Gay meme is very fun. And I also think like, I've literally just done an entire video talking about the ways in which like thematically it makes sense for pirates to be gay, but yeah, moving on. There's also the history of gay pirate media, or as I like to call it, all pirate media. We've come for the cowboys, we're coming for the pirates. As a genre, they rarely concern themselves with historical accuracy. In film, piracy is as much about a life of freedom as it is about a life of crime. They sing like a whole song about that in Muppets Treasure Island and everything. Pirates get to live a life not just outside of the law, but outside of societal norms, including the norms of gender and sexuality. Take Pirates of the Caribbean. For Elizabeth Swan, piracy isn't about like strategically stealing cargo, it's about, you know, an escape from social expectations of gender and class. It's through piracy that Elizabeth has the space to be with Will Turner, the person that she really loves, not the person that society wants her to be with. Elizabeth and Will are honestly the gayest hetero couple ever put to film. Again, I will not be elaborating on it and I also don't make the rules. At least not until I finally get round to my In Defense of Elizabeth Swan video essay that I know a lot of people are still waiting for. It's coming, I promise. Black Sails, on the other hand, makes the queer subtext of piracy just like straight up text. Again, I already made a whole video about how underrated the show is, but basically Black Sails uses the backdrop of piracy as a way to explore queer relationships at a time when they were outright illegal. Like by mid season two, the entire overarching plot of the show is revealed to be fueled by queer rage. It's great. Pirates are already breaking all sorts of laws. So like, why not break the gender and sexuality laws while they're at it? And until Our Flag Means Death, Black Sails was the only pirate TV show or movie that kind of explicitly explored queer relationships in this really focused, like lead role way, at least that the internet has been able to find anyway. Fan reactions. The fan reaction to the show, as I alluded to throughout this video, has been incredible, but also reasonably unexpected. Uh, not only was the show not in any of the big roundups uh, of queer TV before it started airing, it also wasn't in any of them as it was airing. The fact that they kept the queer elements of the show seemingly pretty quiet in that pre-show time and during the show itself until the kiss meant that 
initial viewers talked about the show with a kind of frantic excitement and disbelief when that kiss came. Like they needed people to be watching the show too. They had to find someone to talk to about it. They'd found this gem that like they wanted to share because they didn't see it being shared where they might expect for it being a queer show. The fandom is forming in front of our eyes and it is fascinating. There's this amazing account on TikTok at Cecilia is Grey that's been doing like analysis of the tags and data from AO3 in the mere weeks since the show's kind of finished airing and it is wild. Like you can see patterns of like tags being reused by completely different authors that are going to become, I think, like staples of the fandom. So she looked, for example, at the difference between the amount of fanfic uh, that was being posted before the show officially, you know, confirmed it wasn't queer baiting. We got the kiss in episode nine. And then after that happened and found like a reasonably small amount before and then an average of like a hundred new fix a day since. There have been like dozens, probably like hundreds at this point of articles about the show and its success. And I know that there are at least two long form video essays already out about the show that I did not watch so as not to be decimated by self-doubt and imposter syndrome while making this one. TikTok is full of reactions and cosplay and meta theories about the show. Tumblr is awash with memes and everyone is obsessed with Con O'Neill liking every tweet that suggests that Izzy is a pain sub in love with Blackbeard. Honestly, like all the interactions between the creators of the show and fans have been just really lovely. Like all the actors have been answering questions and sharing behind the scenes footage on TikTok or, you know, sharing fan art on Twitter. There's a lot of direct communication that you don't see for a show this popular in a lot of cases. And I think that can be explained by a fan statement shared by Tiger on his Instagram that says, all around me, I see people that are used to being ignored. This isn't only a love story between characters. This is a love story about all people. This is a love letter for those who are often forgotten. One critic described the show as written as a love letter to minorities by minorities and it shows. The fans basically just can't believe how good the show is. The writers and actors can't believe how popular the show is and everyone is just like screaming at each other on Twitter and in the best way possible. I guess if I'm going to leave you with any conclusion here, it's that the show is very good. Um, there are no bad episodes. And while this video is chock full of spoilers, if for some reason you watched this without having seen the show itself, go and watch the show anyway. Like I've rewatched it a few times now. And honestly, a large portion of the people who watched the show watched it after they'd already seen the kiss scene spoiler anyway. Even if you know exactly what happens in each episode, you're still gonna enjoy like the jokes and performances and all of these like brilliant little details that I didn't have time to include in this script. So go watch or rewatch Our Flag Means Death. Let these gay pirates destroy your life. Uh, you, I promise will not regret it. Thanks so much for watching. I would love to hear in the comments your thoughts about the show. And thanks once again to Raycon and my wonderful patrons over on Patreon. Links to both will obviously be in the description. And until I see you next time, bye. Also, like I've, I had to like push my sofa forward to do this and I'm wearing a whole outfit and I'm kind of sad that you can't see the whole thing, but the like the framing wouldn't have worked. So I'm gonna try and get on my sofa and show you. Okay, here we go. So frilly shirt, cute belt. This is a, this is a whole skirt, got this cute little, pistol that my friend Thomas gave me, the hat that was from uh, a D&D &D live stream that I did, a charity live stream for mermaids. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to see me be a pirate in that. Um, I I want to go to, a if anyone knows of any pirate LARPs or Ren Fairs or whatever coming up um, that I might be able to get to in the UK, I don't know why there would be, but I just really, I feel like I can't just wear this outfit. Maybe I wear this in my daily life. Is that too much? Am I too into this show?